I now call order the uh, regular session meeting of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs on Tuesday, May 6, 2014, 6.30. Roll call. Mayor Archie? Here. Vice Mayor Larson? Here. Commissioner Terrapani? Here. Commissioner Banther is absent this evening. Uh, Commissioner Sieber? Here. Uh, tonight's invocation will be given by Reverend uh, Bob Russell. Will everyone please stand, remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance following? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come tonight to gather in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. As we gather here in the chambers of our city hall, we ask that you provide wisdom and leadership towards the needs of our fair city here in Tarpon Springs. We ask that you bless these proceedings while providing patience to those seeking guidance and information. May we further bless those who may provide the service, the city engineers, city maintenance workers, city hall staff, water department, waste removal, environmental departments. Father, collectively we seek answers for the many family members that still have no idea what has happened to loved ones on Flight 370. Please bless and keep safe members of our armed forces, and especially those families grieving the total sacrifice given to protect the freedom that we so many take for granted. We ask that you bless and guide our state officials, our national leaders, and especially our president, as he lives each and day with such demanding responsibilities. Thank you, Father, for allowing us to live in this great country. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We will now go to public comments on any item that will not be discussed this evening. Please come forward, state your name and address for the record. Good evening, Anita Prost, 901 Bayshore Drive. A couple of things. I want to thank the city manager for getting protection for the men working along the bayou at the house that's being built because it was very dangerous yesterday right next to the road with any, without any defense of a car hitting our employees. I made a call and he went and did it very fast and even today still it's not finished and we have to continue taking care of our employees. On the 17th of this month, the State Historic Preservation will be here in Tarpon Springs and they're going to be at the Golden Crescent taking a walk and a tour of historic homes. For over a year, there has been a palm tree broken in front of Congressman Bill Arrakis's house. I have called the city numerous times to please pick it up and cut down the dead palm tree. As of today, nothing's been done. So I hope that the city can clean the Golden Crescent and make it the crown jewel that we have there. And with the tree that was cut down, I hope that the city will take out the base of that tree and the roots and plant another gorgeous tree on the bayou because they are getting old and we will be losing them as we have in the park. Please, let's take care of our valuable properties of our historic preservation, clean them up, and take care of them. That's on the 17th. Please do something about that palm tree. It's been over a year, and I'm sure everybody has seen it. It's just been sitting there. That's a disgrace for our home. Chris Roboski, 1602 Gulf Beach Boulevard, Tarpon Springs, 34689. I had to leave the last meeting early, unfortunately, for a personal matter, and so I missed out on part of the meeting uh, that took place. And the gun range issue uh, seemed like it was uh, pretty heated, and I watched the video, and I wanted to commend the mayor for the way you handled that. You kept directing people back to the board instead of out there, and I think that was very well done. I appreciate that. We don't need any kind of pettiness or arguments between people at this podium and in the audience. I think you did a very good job with that. Uh, so thank you. And also, uh, I was a bit disappointed that a few things didn't come up as far as questioning uh, the developer. I mean, I personally think it's a good idea to have that range here. 
Um, but I don't know that I could have voted for it as it was presented because they didn't explain about lead. Now, I know they have a very elaborate lead capturing device, very expensive device, but not a single question about did they think about alternatives. In Pinellas County, they even have a document about green rounds that are not toxic, copper rounds, other metals that can be used. I mean, they're shooting at paper targets. You can poke a hole in paper with your finger. You don't need toxic lead to shoot at paper targets. And uh, some places already ban these lead rounds. So they could have saved thousands of dollars of their own money not having to handle that stuff. One thing that they said at the planning and zoning was they were going to test the blood of their employees to get a baseline to see if they had been contaminated over the years. And that alone ought to send off alarm bells, you know. Seems to me you could use rubber bullets. Rubber bullets are non-lethal rounds. So if somebody accidentally shoots themselves when they're, you know, these are people that are being trained to, you know, they don't know how to shoot a gun, allegedly, right? That's why they're there. They accidentally shoot themselves or somebody else, less likely someone would be killed. Why was that not brought up? Why wasn't anybody asking about these alternative rounds? Instead, it was just assumed that lead was the only way to go. And I think that's really unfortunate. And it appears to be too late. But if you have any more communications with them, at least ask them if they've considered it and why they didn't do it. Because the people that live in the buildings around there, the, the, the homeowners, they should probably get a baseline lead testing as well. Just in case their thousands of dollar uh, contraption fails. Because it's the EPA that governs that. How often do you think they're going to come down here and check that out? Not very often. So anyway, that's, uh, it's just unfortunate. I think that, that that could have been brought up. Oh, and the other issue, of course, is the, uh, the ever elusive, never gets old hearing it, traffic study. That somehow you build something somewhere and it doesn't add any more cars to the road. But uh, unless you got $10,000 and a traffic engineer that never wants to work again for the rest of his life, you're never going to prove otherwise. But it just it flies in the face of logic. So you're going to be hearing that a lot <laughs> for proposals all over town. Just be nice to have somebody be honest about it for once. But again, thank you, Mayor. I think you did a wonderful job. And I wish I would have been here to see it in person. Thanks. If there are no other uh, public comments, uh, we'll go to special presentation. This is resolution uh, 2014-13. In memory of Ms. Uh, Mildred Wilson, for those of you that know that she passed, this was presented earlier. Um, so it goes uh, resolution 2014-13, resolution of the Board of Commissioners on the, the city of Tarpa Springs, Florida noting with deep regret to pass the Mildred Wilson, whereas our friend and longtime resident has been called from us to enjoy everlasting, and whereas we are profoundly grieved at the passing of a friend, public servant, and a prominent member of the community, a woman who always uh, worked for the best interests of our community, and whereas Mildred Wilson volunteered for over 45 years to Girl Scouts of USA, served as a member of Citizen Alliance for Progress, a member of the Advisory Council of the Salvation Army in Tarpon Springs, a member of the Presbyterian Church in Tarpon Springs, where she was ordained elder and chairperson of the Christian Education Committee, and served as a board member of the Tarpon Springs Historical Society, and whereas Mr. Wilson continued her dedication to teach by being a mentor at Tarpon Springs Elementary School and taught private piano lessons to children in Tarpon Springs, and whereas Mr. Mildred Wilson viewed all children as the most valuable gift from God, had mother four of her own children, enjoyed working with children, helping them, inspiring them, and sharing life experiences with them, whereas the city of Tarpon Springs wished to remember Mildred Wilson <clears throat> a remarkable woman of distinction and contributed to society, a mentor of children and a role model for future generations. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpa Springs that the Board of Commissioners with sincere regret takes notice of the past of Mildred Wilson and that the resolution be spread upon the minutes of the City Commission and that a copy be transmitted under the seal of the city to the family of Mildred Wilson. Uh, be it resolved that a copy of this resolution will be transmitted to the State of Florida Department of Archives and the 
Topper Springs Historical Society. <coughs> I don't think there's anyone here to receive this. So we'll go to um, proclamations. This one is uh, Municipal Clerks <laughs> Week. And this proclamation reads, where the open exchange of public discourse is essential to the democratic system of government, where as a cornerstone of democracy, uh, Americans have observed, oh, I might be reading the wrong one. No, it's in the frame. Oh, okay. Oh, y'all yeah, got a frame. I, we didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about this. This reads uh, proclamation city of Tarver Springs, whereas municipal uh, clerks are responsible for the legislative operation of city government, and whereas the position of city clerk, historically one of the oldest of public professions, and whereas no other office in municipal public service has so many diverse uh, contacts serving the mayor, city council, city departments, and outside agencies, and whereas the office of the city clerk functions as a Connecting hub of the organization, linking community members with their local government service, and whereas the municipal clerk is the city's official records management officer, custodian of public records, and keeper of the archives with direct signature authority on official documents of the municipality, where the city clerk's office is proud to be the primary citywide information resource, providing versatile, accurate, and composed service to government and citizens alike, remaining ever mindful of neutrality and impartiality in rendering uh, equal service to all, and whereas the city of Tarver Springs extends appreciation to our city clerk, Irene Jacobs, and the deputy city clerk, uh, Michelle Manusas, for the essential services they perform in exemplary dedication to the community they represent. Now, therefore, I, David Archie, by virtue of the authority vested in me as mayor of the city of Tarver Spring, do hereby recognize the week of May 4th through May 10th, 2014, as Municipal Clerks Week. And Ms. Jacobs is a little under the weather, so we'll ask Ms. Manusas. Any uh, public comments on this item? I'm, I was trying to do this one. Maybe it's, it's important. It's a uh, proclamation for Civility Month. Uh, while I think that every day should be Civility Day, but uh, this proclamation reads, the open the exchange of public uh, discourse is essential to the democratic system of government and as a cornerstone of democracy, Americans have observed certain rules of behavior generally known as civility. Civility derived from the Latin words civitas, meaning city, and civis, meaning uh, citizen, is behavior worthy of citizens living in the community or in common, or in common with others. And whereas displays of anger, rudeness, ridicule, impatience, and lack of respect and personal attacks distract from open exchange of ideas, prevent fair dis uh, discussion of the issues, and can discourage individuals from participation in government. And where a civility can assist in reaching consensus on diverse issues and allow for mutually respectful ongoing relationship. And where a civility can uplift our daily life and make it more pleasant to live in an organized society. Now, therefore, I, David Archie, by virtue of authority vested in me as mayor of the city of Tarver Spring, do hereby proclaim the month of May as Civility Month. Are there any public comments on this item? Hearing none, we will go to our next uh, proclamation. It's uh, Ola Americans Month, and this proclamation reads, where the city of Tarver Spring recognizes that older adults are the roots from which our community grows, who bestow gifts of wisdom and insight upon younger generations, 
and strengthen the bonds between neighbors to create a better place to live. And whereas the city of Tarpon Springs is committed to valuing, valuing all of individuals and recognize their ongoing life achievements. <coughs> and whereas older adults are active community members involved in volunteering, mentorship, arts, culture, and civic engagement. Whereas recognizing the successes of community elders encourages their ongoing participation in further accomplishments, and whereas our community can provide opportunities to allow older citizens to continue to flourish by emphasizing the importance of elders and their leadership by publicly recognizing their continued achievements, presenting opportunities for older Americans to share their wisdom, experience, and skills, recognizing older Americans as a valuable asset in strengthening American communities. Now, therefore, I, David Orange, by virtue of authority vested me as mayor of the city of Tarpon Springs, do hereby proclaim the month of May 2014 as Older Americans Month. And uh, I don't think we have anyone here to accept this one. Any public comments on this item? <clears throat> Next, we'll go to a uh, proclamation for National Safe Bolton. Uh, week. And this proclamation reads, whereas an average 700 people die each year in Bolton related accidents in the U.S., approximately 71 percent of these fatalities caused by drowning, and whereas the vast majority of these accidents are caused by human error or poor judgment and not by the boat equipment or environmental factors, whereas a significant number of voters who lose their lives by drowning each year would be alive today had they worn their life jackets, whereas today's life jackets are more comfortable, more attractive, and more wearable than styles of past year, of years past, and deserve a fresh look by today's Bolton public. Now, therefore, I, David Reich, by virtue of authority, vested in me as North, uh, by the third, virtue of authority vested in me, uh, do hereby support the goals of the North American Safe Bolton Campaign and proclaim May 17th through uh, May 23rd, 2014 as National Bolton Week. Uh, I think we have uh, Roy Warner from the Coast Guard here. on this item. Next we'll uh, go to Building Safety Month. This reminds me of the older Americans because they, they made this print real small for me. <laughs> so I'm going to see if I can see. <coughs> um, whereas our city is continuing efforts to address the critical issues of safety, emergency safety, energy, efficiency, and resiliency in the built environment that affects, that affect our citizens both in everyday life and times of natural disaster give us confidence that our structures are safe and sound, whereas our confidence is achieved through the devotion of uh, vigilant guardians, building safety, fire prevention officials, architects, engineers, builders, tradespeople, laborers, and others in the construction industry who work year-round to ensure the safety of construction of buildings. And whereas these guardians, dedicated members of the International Code Council, use a governmental consensus process that brings together local, state, federal officials with expertise in the uh, built environment to create and implement the highest quality codes to protect Americans in the buildings we, where we live, learn, work, worship, play, and whereas the international codes, the most widely adopted building safety, energy, and fire prevention codes in the nation are used by most U.S. cities, 
counties and states, these modern building codes also include safeguards to protect the public from natural disasters such as hurricanes, uh, snowstorms, tornadoes, wildfires, earthquakes, and whereas Building Safety Month is sponsored by the International Code Council to remind the public about the critical role of our communities, largely unknown guardians of public safety, our local code officials who assure us of safe, efficient, and livable buildings, whereas building safety maximizing resilience, maximizing, uh, minimizing risks. The theme for Building Safety Month 2014 encourages all Americans to uh, raise awareness of the importance of building safe and resilient construction, fire prevention, disaster mitigation, uh, backyard safety, energy efficiency, and newer technologies in the construction industry. Uh, building Safety Month 2014 encourages appropriate steps everyone can take to ensure that the places where we live, learn, work, worship, and play are safe and sustainable, recognizing that countless lives have been saved due to the implementation of safety codes by local and state agencies, and whereas each year in observance of Building Safety Month, Americans are asked to consider projects to improve building safety and sustainability at home and in the community and to acknowledge the essential service provided to all of us by local state building departments, fire prevention bureaus, federal agencies in protecting lives and property. Now, therefore, I, David Arch, by virtue of authority vested in me as the mayor of the city of Tarpa Springs, Florida, do hereby proclaim the month of May 2014 as Building Safety Month. And I'm not sure who's going to get this. I have Mr. DePasqua and Chief Butcher. I just wanted to take a moment to uh, recognize our staff who work obviously very hard to ensure and of course the, with the cooperation of our fire department ensure buildings are, are built for our community properly and they meet code and they're safe for our citizens, property owners, residents and visitors and so I, you know, I certainly would be remiss if I did not mention our staff so I want to thank you. Thank you. Any uh, public comments? <clears throat> Hearing none, we will go to our consent agenda. Uh, we have attorney fees, Thompson, Sizemo, Gonzalez, and here in LLP invoice 75245, uh, and we have invoice 75398. Zinzal Law, uh, invoice 13476. Seven is special events, Sunset Praise and Worship, St. Ignatius of Antioch uh, Life Team. That's May 3rd. Out of School Beach Bags Recreation Division, May 31st. Eight is authorized execution of MRAP transfer agreement with the state of Florida. Uh, nine is authorized execution of addendum to Pinellas Countywide Memorandum of Understanding for Transportation of Arrested persons under Florida Baker Act Law. Tenants renew file number 130094-C-CM, Road and Landscape Material Co-op utilizing Pinellas County Cooperative Contract number 123-0215-BKL. 11 is ratified file number 140056-N-JJ. Bayou Shore Restoration. 12 is renewed file number 110067-C-TK, Uniforms Work. Uh, 13 is approved reclassification, reclassification of positions within Tarpon Springs Fire Rescue pursuant to ordinance 2011-19. 14 is authorized utilization of the City of St. Petersburg, RFQ number 7563, Landscape Contractor Services. 15 is Renew RFP number 110050-P-CM, 
Debris Removal Disaster Recovery Services. 16 is renewed file number 100067-C-TK, Revenue Producing uh, Hillsborough County RFP number S-0001-09 JSW Purchasing Card Program Services. And uh, 17 is increased file number 140045-N-DM Centrifuge Decanter uh, o, uh, e M parts. Is there any item? Number 11. Number 11? Anything else? Chair will entertain a motion. Move approval. Second. It's for all items <clears throat> except uh, number 11. Any uh, public comments on any of these items? Hmm? 11 was not up yet, so. Uh, roll call. Commissioner Seaver? Yes. Commissioner Chair Panning? Yes. Vice Mayor Larson? Yes. Mayor Archie? Yes. Um, item number 11, ratify file number 140056 uh, by Yashua. Thank you. I'm um, just looking for a little clarification on this. On the second page of the backup. Uh, last paragraph it says as set out in the joint agreement with the ACOE in Pinellas County the city will receive credit credits against the Bayou Shore restoration project in the amount of 32,400 therefore the total cost to the city for the additional work will be 6,900 my question is I know uh, I don't know a number of weeks ago we we had to increase the the amount that we had to pay to uh, the ACOE um, I think that was a couple hundred thousand dollars um, but uh, my understanding was at that point our portion was going to be closed out for the Bayou Shore Restoration Project. Um, so here when it says the credits will be against the Bayou Shore Restoration Project, my understanding is that's already closed. So in what form will the credits come? Will they, they'll come from, from uh, the Army Corps or they'll come from Pinellas County? Both. Um, as you see from the backup, uh, and Mr. Functions here to, to explain if you can, obviously it's going to take the federal government a long time to reconcile and see if we are going to get any of that money back that we allocated. Obviously, they got to add everything else, do it. We're hoping for money back. This portion that we had to do with stormwater, um, we can submit for our credits to, again, end up paying the proportion, which will end up, instead of 34 on that, this was to extend our stormwater out there. So we're getting this in while the feds are doing their final tabulation and stuff, and hopefully we'll have good news that we will be getting some of that money we allocated, that that money will not be used and we'll have that back for us. So this all counts towards um, that percentage that they pay. And again, Mr. Function's here to explain how this one got like it is. And right. so where it's now before, it's submitted now instead of uh, from before. Right, so where was the, I guess now I'm curious where the disconnect was. Again, I see in the backup where it says, initial discussions we thought uh, we became aware of became aware of it necessary necessary to extend but then we didn't and now we are the so function you want to come up and explain that good evening Tom function public works director uh, yeah uh, it comes to my attention of course uh, prior to the project that these stormwater course but it needed to be extended no matter what they put out on the shoreline it still had to be extended uh, and we were under the impression originally from the Army Corps that this was part of the project. Uh, after reviewing, I guess, the documentation, it came back and says, no, this wasn't a direct, uh, uh, a direct result of the restoration, that we would have to directly contract with Nelson uh, in order to do the project, uh, and then we would be reimbursed those funds if, if uh, 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 the Army Corps now felt it was part of the, then become part of the project, which we were under, under the impression they, are, they, they will be part of the project. So I guess where is the, uh, I'm a little curious now, where, the, where the, we're going to pick up on the stormwater and where we're going to extend on that portion of uh, South Spring Boulevard and Whitman. It was extended beyond uh, when they re, uh, redid the shoreline. Mm -hmm. The pipes that were there existing there were, were of course, uh, uh, within inside the zone, so they had to extend the, the storm pipe out beyond the, uh, the new uh, uh, embankment. So the work's already been performed. It's been done, yes. So now yes. we're going to pay for it. Yes, yes. And that's where the mistake came in. We thought was uh, we were on the impression that that was going to be part of the the, uh, the whole project. When we come to find out later on from the Car Army Corps of Engineers that it wasn't, we had a direct contract with Nelson, but then get the credits back for doing the work. That's why the final cost should be around sixty nine hundred dollars for the project. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. <clears throat> Any uh, public comments on this item? I, unless somebody else have a question for Mr. Punch. Chris Roboski, 1602 Gulf Beach Boulevard, Tarpon Springs, 34689. So the questions that come to my mind are, is this $38,000 coming out of the 100000 that you set aside earlier? Um, or is this coming out separately? And if so, where's that other 100000 You see, recently you had an audit by the uh, independent auditor. Um, and I saw an article in the newspaper about St. Petersburg. They use that same auditor, by the way, independent auditor, right? In 2011 and 2012 for sure. But they missed $95 million. How is it that that independent auditor didn't see that? But the new administration that came in, Christman's administration, found $95 million in missing money. And what it was was it was in these projects. They would ask for more money than they needed and then not spend it all. But then nobody checked to see where that extra money was. Isn't that bizarre? Interesting. So I don't know that that's happening here, but that's the problem. I don't know. And I do know that the auditor didn't catch it. The exact same auditor that we have didn't catch it in St. Petersburg. So who's catching it here? 38000 for this, but you took out an extra 100000 for cost overruns a few meetings back. So where is that money? Does it go into a separate account, or does it always stay in the main account, and then just you just have access to it? I mean, how is that working? What is the, the nature of that? How is that function? And how are these credits going to function? Is it going to be, in fact, they just owe us for the next project, or will we, in fact, get a check back for that exact amount of money? And then we're still on the hook for seven grand or whatever it is. So how did that happen? And how do we prevent that from happening again? And who's checking in to see if there's any of this extra money for projects that didn't get spent? Thank you. Nita Protus, 901 Bayshore Drive. Is this project finished? Because restoration of the bayou area, there is still water up to the road as you go around. And that's what the citizens have been asking about for years. Now we have an industrial park looking around our bayou. And as the city manager told me, that he let uh, Mr. De Pasqua negotiate and take care of this, and he was the one responsible. Well, it doesn't really look good, and the rest of the bayou is fading out. The road is going to come out. What else are we going to do around the bayou? You're not going to like me tonight, Mr. LaCourse but I really don't care because I still like you. But the thing is, you are the city manager. You are the commission and you are the mayor. The city manager should negotiate these and put his name on it. Not Mr. De Pasqua. he doesn't live here. So I want my portion of his salary deducted from him every month for the last three things that have happened in the city under his leadership. And I'm very adamant about that. And the second thing is, we need to look at the bayou. The water was up in the road again this week, in front of Jackie Pappas's house, Mary Burris's house, all the way around. And those rocks there are not going to help the rest of the bayou. So now we've got this money, and it's assumed. Well, who's assuming? Whose name was on it? This is why we need work sessions on these big projects, so the citizens can get the answers and we can come to you. We used to have work sessions, and you didn't have the problems that you have now. Let's not assume things. When the city puts its name on the dotted line, let's make sure everything is correct and you have all the answers. Also, did anyone do the research about the covenant that was made on those properties, about the research about who gave the property and why? Is it legal what we did? We need to go back into the city clerk's office and find out who gave all that property and why and what it's supposed to be used for. Again, we didn't do that. So there may be some repercussions about that property and the way it was used. We need to look into that. I'm researching it now. And when Mr. Noblin and some of those older fathers of the city gave that property, there was a use for it. And now it can't be used. 
history always has a way to repeat itself. Are there any other public comments? Chair will entertain a motion. I'm not sure what your pleasure is. You want to discuss well, I'll, it? Yeah. I'll say this, uh, Mayor, if I may. Go ahead. Um, it, was, it was my desire the last time we had additional money spent on this project not to ap approve the, the allotment of funds until we had a presentation on where this project was at. And I'll maintain the position, and I will not support this. Any uh, further? Uh, move to comments, because um, if I might ask, uh, this this money has already been expended. And now the we works are, again, we went through this before. The work's already been done. This is the approval so we can get through and get reimbursement. Um, if we want to go into a review or if I have to come back and give the facts that weren't exactly what Ms. Protus gave or the other ones, we'll bring all those facts back to you. But let's, in the sake of civilian, let's put it this way. It was a $4 million shoreline restoration project where the city, in the end, is going to pay 16% of it. Everything you see done around both bayous, $4 million, 12 years in the making, a ton of hard work, to get so we would get those federal funds. Four million, the city's gonna be responsible for 17% of that. The rest is the county and stuff. Um, we can go back to accounting, we can go about that, but this is work that was done by Nelson Construction for us. The work is done, we need to pay the work, and then any review later, or if you find fault with anybody, find fault, we need to do it at a later time. We certainly didn't want to postpone and not pay our obligations to the federal government on a federal grant. Um, that would have just been disastrous because I can guarantee you we'd have trouble getting them again. So we need to pay this money, and then if we want to go back and review or bring everything back, but again, how anybody can take negativity out of a $4 million grant that the city has to pay 17% of to restore those two shorelines um, in the last appropriation for that thing that other communities would give anything for is just a little beyond my understanding. So I would hope you would approve this and then whatever you want to bring me back at a later time, I'll bring it back to you and stuff, but let's pay Nelson Construction who did this job for us and then, you know, we'll let the facts go where it may afterwards. Uh, and one of the, I guess, question was, um, for the credits are concerned, you know, what's the process or how would that come back to the city? Um, Mr. Passy, we're going to explain the, the system. <clears throat> uh, good evening again. Joseph DePosco, the city's development services director. Um, the way the credits work are anything that is part of Nelson's contract with the Army Corps, Army Corps has hired them to do the work, is split 65 35 between the core they pay 65 percent and we pay 35 percent we've split our 35 percent with the county under that under that uh, interlocal agreement this work is outside the scope of that contract that the core has with david nelson so we submit it to the core under what's called work in kind we'll submit the total amount that we're going to pay nelson for this work that is associated with the project we've been given written confirmation that they will accept it as credit for the project they will put that into the, the project funding, and ultimately it'll be part of the pot of money that will get split up into those percentages. Um, we're, the indications we're, we're getting is that the project, when it all shakes out, will end up with a refund. We've probably overpaid at this point. It may take 12 months to get that rectified and reconciled at the federal government. But I think the numbers that Mr. Funchen had provided to you are going to be accurate. I'm fairly confident they're going to shake out that way. So if, out of the dollars that are being spent, Roughly 17.5% will be the city's burden, 17.5% will be the county's burden, and the core will pay the balance. And the $6,900 basically was work that needed to be done 
but it was not work that could be um, considered as part of the show line. That's correct. There, there was three or four elements, Mayor, that were not considered part of the actual contract that the Corps hired David Nelson to do, and the city handled those separately. This is one of those several projects. We've submitted all those dollars for credit towards the project, and the Corps has already approved the previous ones at a 65-35 split, and the county has agreed to split our portion. So I think what the city manager is saying when it's all said and done, and I'm happy to bring back the total dollars when the, when the project's reconciled, but I think we're looking at between 16 and 17 and a half percent to do that project of city dollars for a roughly a $4 million project. So, I mean, it's, it's definitely, it's a great program, I think, for the city uh, to take advantage of. Thank you. Right. And, you know, my thoughts are it's kind of like where we was with the other one is that, you know, this is one that we owe Nelson construction. The city owes them. Work's been done. We owe them. Now, we can protest and say that we don't like it. And I don't mind, as Commissioner Tarpani talked about, bringing whomever that he chooses, um, you know, to come and talk about the overall project and what happened and what uh, did not happen. I, I don't like it where the city is at a point where as they have uh, asked someone to do work, they do the work, and then we say we won't pay them. And I don't see how we can not pay them. Um, so, you know, we, we either decide tonight to pay them or we wait and uh, we'll be talking to probably somebody from a legal perspective of paying them because we have entered into an agreement with them. They've done the work. Now all we're talking about is paying. And I think that that's a little different than what uh, Commissioner Tarapani is asking for, and that's for people to come in <coughs> and explain the whole project. But even after that's explained, we still have entered into a contract and we still owe Nelson uh, construction. So, you know, we're at a point, you can decide whatever you choose to, but my thoughts are we, we owe some people as a city of Tarpa, we should want to pay them, and then whatever we need to do um, along the lines of uh, having uh, this project be explained, we, we, we ask the city manager to, to bring those people in and let's talk, you know. So this is kind of where we're at. Mayor. Yes, sir. Um, I, I'm in agreement with the mayor in terms of if we have an obligation that, that we're going to have to, to pay on that obligation. And in a moment, I'll, I'll make a motion to do so. Um, but I also am in agreement with Commissioner Terrapani in terms of having some concerns with the project. Um, and, and one concern I have is that paragraph that Commissioner Terrapani read says the city will receive credits against the Bayou Shore Restoration Project. But I, I thought I heard, maybe I misunderstood, but I thought I heard the city manager saying we're hoping to receive credits. And that, that's a big concern to me as well, because, the, again, the memo says the city will receive credits, but I'm hearing that we hope to receive credits. So that's a concern. Uh, I, I think some of the comments made by a former mayor, uh, Ms. Protus, I think a lot of her comments um, are, are shared by other people in the community. I think there are people that are not necessarily happy with the uh, – the outcome of the project. So I, I would support Commissioner Terrapani in terms of having some kind of future agenda item where we can really take a closer look at the project. Um, as Mr. DePasqua said, uh, see exactly uh, how the, the money is going to shake out in terms of exactly what the, the credit uh, credits that we receive will be and if it turns out to be the 17 percent or whatever. I, I definitely think it's uh, important that we take a future look at, at this project. Again, having said that, I, I am in agreement with the mayor that uh, the bottom line is we, we owe this money to Nelson Construction. Uh, and, and so having said that, I, I make a motion to approve the, gen the agenda item. Yeah, second. I second. Any uh, public comments on this item? Uh, roll call. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Commissioner Terrapani? No. Vice Mayor Larson? Yes. Mayor Archie? Yes. <clears throat> Next item that we have is special consent. Um, item number 18, select uh, Tetra Tech Incorporated for RFQ number 14002. Uh, eight. 
S-J-J -J Professional Engineering Services for Reclaimed Water Tank and Pump Station Design. Uh, Ms. Robertson. Thank you for my invitation. Good evening. I'm Bob Robertson, Public Services Program Manager. The item on your agenda tonight is for approval of a contract for engineering services with Tetra Tech Incorporated. Uh, Tetra Tech would be providing design and services during construction for a new reclaimed water storage tank and a, a new high service pumping station, both of which would be located at the Tarpon Springs Municipal Golf Course. Their services uh, not only include design and permitting, but also <coughs> include, include geotechnical work, survey, and public outreach during construction, or prior to construction, excuse me. Is there any questions I can <clears throat> answer those? Uh, is this the one that 50% uh, will be paid by uh, SwiftMart? Yes, sir. 50% of the design and 50% of the construction will be paid by the Southwest Florida Water Management District. Any questions, Ms. Rupp? Any uh, public comments on this item? Chris Roboski, 1602 Gulf Beach Boulevard, Tarpon Springs, 34689. Yeah, the only thing that, I mean, I read that, um, <coughs> and I believe it said in order, something in there about more distribution, and it, I mean, it's sort of like putting the cart before the horse because you want to have the distribution of what we already have, right? This is for the uh, reclaimed water tank. So I believe right now we already have reclaimed water I guess we're selling it to the county. We're not really getting it to the residents. Would it make more sense to spend money uh, distributing the water that we're already collecting instead of uh, collecting more water and having to pay for the maintenance and the pumps on that thing um, when we don't even have this distribution set up very well yet? So, I mean, I get that this is another one of those deals where it's like, hey, guys, we're going to get 50% of this great thing paid for. So we should take it, you know, but 50% of something that you don't necessarily need, uh, that just doesn't seem to make sense. It would make more sense to put more, more money into the distribution end of it, make it less expensive for residents to utilize that water that we collect. I mean, that's, that's my understanding of it. I had a very brief moment to, to, to read that uh, section today. But again, why? Are we just spending money because we can get more money? I mean, I, I'm confused. Do we really need this tank? Has there been, did somebody prove to this commission that we needed this extra water yet? Um, and if so, then when, how are you gonna distribute it? You're gonna, we're gonna pay for that, right? We're gonna end up paying, I don't, I don't know that there's a Swift Mud 50% uh, off deal for distribution. We're basically gonna be collecting more water and how are we gonna get it out to the people? The people are gonna pay for that. So I. You know, I don't know. It just seems like you got to ask more questions is all I'm saying. Thanks. Bye. Any uh, other public comments? Joe, let a motion. Move for approval. Second. Roll call. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Commissioner Terrapani? Yes. Vice Mayor Larson? Yes. Mayor Archie? Yes. Uh, item number 19, select uh, Stantec for RFQ 140031-S-JJ, Stormwater Engineering Services Continuing Contract. Good evening. Bob Robertson, Public Services Program Manager. This item is for a, to asking, requesting approval for a new contract with an engineering firm known as Stantec. Uh, they would, this would be for a five-year term. Um, this replaces the um, expired contract now with American Consulting Engineers, our, our current and former, I guess, stormwater engineering services uh, contractor. They provided those services under a similar five-year contract. Um, the services would be for engineering, planning, design, modeling, and any other services related to the stormwater program. Any questions? Uh, will you just briefly talk about the advantages of entering into this type of continuing contract? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, one of the advantages of, of entering into a continuing services contract like this is it allows the utility to have essentially engineering services on demand. 
And especially with a, a stormwater improvement program, capital improvement program like we have here with um, many projects outlaid over many years, uh, this allows us to be very efficient in providing the design services, um, getting the designs on the books, getting the projects advertised, and ultimately what we really all want is getting these stormwater improvement projects to construction. Projects that you've seen like Distant Avenue and Hibiscus Street and Roosevelt, those are projects that have all been done under a co uh, continuing services type contract with engine for engineering. Is this uh, funds already budgeted? These are funds that are available under the stormwater utility. So what we're asking for is uh, approval of an upper limit. Um, the money would be approved for each of these projects uh, against that limit, um, not for the construction, but just for the engineering side. So um, we've asked for an annual cap of $500,000 of design work. And just to give you an example, the next fiscal year has $456,000 identified for design services, but that's just in the capital improvement plan. Uh, this gives us a little extra room to, to deal with uh, other stormwater issues as they come up, um, legal challenges as, as we're dealing with one now, uh, other things that, that we may not anticipate. Thank you. Any other questions, um, uh, Vice Mayor Moss? Thank you. Uh, I'm just wondering where the, the $500,000 figure, how, how that number was reached in terms of the annual not to exceed amount. Yes, sir. Well, what, as I was just getting to, um, the Stormwater Action Plan has uh, eight projects identified for the next fiscal year, fiscal 2015. And as I said, we have 400 and – I'm sorry, I, my, my thing is printed very small <laughs> – dollars identified just for design services next year. So that's how we came up with the 500000 But this is an annual amount for five years. Right. I guess I'm trying to understand how, how much the amount would be for the future years. Is that, that number you gave, is that a pretty, is that likely to continue? Uh, likely, yes. The number fluctuates and, uh, sure. Jay, I think if you can address how we address the annual amount. Um, but the, the basis is, is close to that every year. Some years it's less, some years it's more. And if it were to go above, above 500,000, that would have to come back We'd come to, back to the board for approval. The board. Yes. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Just any public comments on this item? Chair will entertain a motion. <coughs> Move for approval. Second. Roll call. Mr. Sieber? Yes. Mr. Terpani? Yes. Vice Mayor Larson? <coughs> yes. Mayor Archie? Yes. Uh, item uh, 20. Uh, a is the uh, job order contract and increase RFP number 09100-P job order contracting. Can I Mr. Function and Mr. Jack has come to the podium to answer any questions? Basically, the good news is we've got Live Oak and the road. We've got uh, Safford and Live Oak open. Um, finally, the, obviously, here comes the place where we need to settle up uh, settle up on that and get it paid. So, Mr. Functioner, would you like to review these? Good evening again. <laughs> yeah, this is the completion of the, uh, the sewer line, uh, insulation repair and, and finalizing of the, uh, uh, the project. Um, again, the only thing I can guarantee on any type of construction job is that there's no guarantees on any type of construction jobs. Uh, the final uh, month was, uh, as you know, was uh, very hectic and very, uh, uh, wet, uh, which added to some of our costs, uh, but the project is done, complete, uh, in operation, and uh, this will be the uh, the final on this project. Oh, Commissioner Tarpani. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm a little uh, confused in the backup. Um, beginning on the uh, on December 15, 2009, uh, we award the RFP to MassTech, uh, et cetera. And then on December 14, 2010, the contractor was renewed with MassTech Inc., or, you know, Wallbridge and Aviation Construction Inc., not being recommended due to performance concerns. So at that, in 2010, we, we stopped using them due to performance concerns? Uh, Is that not MassTech, uh, Wallbridge. 
Uh, there's two different companies. MassTech did uh, 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 horizontal, and Walbridge did vertical, which is building building type of work. And we mm -hmm. used them on a couple of projects, but we're not happy with the performance at that time. Okay, so we weren't happy with their performance in 2010. And then it goes January 10, 2012, the contract was renewed with MassTech and Walbridge. So are you saying Walbridge? Yes, <coughs> my mistake uh, was Ovation, who we had uh, performance issues with, okay. and they were not renewed. And then uh, a couple of years later, Walbridge wanted an increase, and we didn't feel that it was warranted, so uh, we chose to just go with MazTech. I understand. Thank you. Um, so now my question is, on March 4, 2014, the contract amount was increased by 250000 to 1825000 So that was March 4th, and now we're asking for 211000 from March 4th to uh, May 6th to finish out the project? Yes, sir. Thank yes, you. Sir, that's correct. Any additional questions? Any uh, public comments on this <clears throat> item? Besides, we're glad to get to the end. Um, Chair will entertain a motion. We have approval. Second. Uh, roll call. Is this for A and for A? Just for this is for A. Okay. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Commissioner Terrapani? Yes. Vice Mayor Larson? Yes. Mayor Archie? Yes. Item number 20B, increased file number 130-120-C. I see um, job order contract and system. Uh, prior to this uh, large project, um, most of the jobs didn't amount to a lot of money. Um, each year we spent with uh, the Gordian Group less than $25,000, so that's why we administratively approved the contracts, which is in accordance with the ordinance. Uh, but due to the emergency project, uh, they received 5% for using their software and, and, uh, and uh, pricing program. So based on the $2 million at 5%, that's why the, the huge increase. Any additional questions for Mr. Jacobs? Any public comments? Chair will entertain a motion. Move approval. Second. Roll call. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Commissioner Terrapani? Yes. Vice Mayor Larson? Yes. Mayor Archie? Yes. <coughs> Audits and resolution item number 20A, application 1398, uh, Marabella Associates, LLC, annexation of 3.1 <coughs> acres located at southeast corner of North Pinellas Avenue and Anclo Road East, providing for commercial general and preservation on the future land use map, providing for general business and land conservation uh, zoning uh, district. Uh, this is uh, uh, legislative, legislative, and quasi-judicial, but second reading. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, we have quasi-judicial proceedings in items number 21, 22, and 23 tonight. We don't have a lot of people in the audience, so I would ask that uh, when I read the quasi-judicial announcement that uh, those persons appearing for those items tonight intending to testify, please stand and be sworn. Relative to item number 21, uh, application 13-98, it's a quasi-judicial proceeding where the commission acts in a quasi-judicial rather than a legislative capacity. At such a hearing, it is not the commission's function to make law, but rather to apply law that has already been established. In such a hearing, the commission is required by law to make findings of fact based upon the evidence presented at the hearing and apply those findings of fact to previously established criteria contained in the city's code in order to make a legal decision regarding the application. The Commission may only consider evidence at this hearing that the law considers competent, substantial, and relevant to the issues. If that evidence at the hearing demonstrates that the applicant has met the criteria established in the code, then the Commission is required by law to find in favor of the applicant. By the same token, if that competent, substantial, and relevant evidence demonstrates that the applicant has failed to meet the criteria established in the code, then the Commission is required by law to find against the applicant. There is an established procedure at such a hearing. All witnesses must give their testimony under oath. All persons testifying must give their name and address for the record. All testimony and questioning must address matters that are relevant and material to the issues under consideration. The city staff will present its testimony and evidence first. The applicant will then have an opportunity to cross-examine city staff. The applicant will present its testimony and witnesses. The city staff will have an opportunity to cross-examine the applicant's witnesses. Members of the public opposing the application will be given an opportunity to present testimony. After all, members of the public speaking in opposition to the application have concluded, 
Members of the public in support of the application will have an opportunity to present testimony. Each member of the public is limited to four minutes. The applicant will then have an opportunity to make a closing argument or summary, after which city staff will be given an opportunity to make a closing argument or summary. Following this, the commission will consider the matter. Commissioners may ask questions of the witnesses. A motion will be made and a vote will be taken. I read the ordinances for item number 21. Ordinance 2014-04, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, annexing approximately 3.1 acres more or less of real property lying in the north one half, section, one half of Section 12. Township 27 South Range 15 East, located at the southeast corner of the intersection of North Pinellas Avenue and Anclote Road, providing for findings and providing effective dates. A second reading of Ordinance 2014-04 by title only was published in the Tampa Bay Times by title only with a map on March 1 and April 26, 2014. Ordinance 2014-05, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending the future land use map of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida. For annexed property lying in the north half of Section 12, Township 27 South, Range 15 East, located at the southeast corner of the intersection of North Pinellas Avenue and Anclote Road, from Pinellas County future land use designations of CG, Commercial General, and P, Preservation to City of Tarpon Springs future land use designations of CG, Commercial General, and P, Preservation. Providing for findings and providing an effective dates, a second reading of 2014-05 by title only. It was published in the Tampa Bay Times by title only with a map on March 1 and April 26, 2014. Ordinance 2014-03. An ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending the official zoning map of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida for annexed property lying in the north half of Section 12, Township 27 South. Range 15 East, located at the southeast corner of the intersection of North Pinellas Avenue and Anclote Road. From Pinellas County zoning designations of C1, Neighborhood Commercial District, and AE, Agricultural Estate, to City of Tarpon Springs zoning designations of GB, General Business District, and LC, Land Conservation. Providing for findings and providing an effective dates, so Ordinance 2014-03, second reading by title only, published in the Tampa Bay Times by title only with a map on March 1 and April 26. 2014. I would ask for the commission to disclose any ex parte communications at this time. And I'm going to ask anyone who intends to testify in this application or the following two to please stand and be sworn at this time. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this proceeding is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Thank you. This is application 13-98 for Mirabella Associates. Uh, this is an annexation application um, an application of uh, Pinellas, City of Tarpon Springs land use and zoning um, on the annex property. Uh, there's no new information since first reading and the staff recommendation is to um, approve orders 2014-04, 2014-05, and 2014-03 um, as presented in the staff report and the first reading um, I'll be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you. Um, do anyone have any uh, additional questions? The second <coughs> reading. If not, then uh, Chairman entertain a motion on um, the first part, which is the ordinance uh, 2014-04 and annexation. Uh, the legislative move to approve ordinance 2014-04 second roll call mr siever yes mr terrapani yes vice mayor larson yes mayor archie yes uh, item uh, 21b <laughs> is ordinance 2014-05 future land use designation uh legislative for uh, also second read move for approval second Roll call. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Commissioner Terrapani? Yes. Vice Mayor Larson? Yes. Mayor Archie? Yes. Item 21C, uh, Ordinance 2014-03, Zoning Classification, uh, second uh, reading. Move for approval. Second. Uh, would the applicant like to make any uh, statement? You don't have to. Okay. If you have none, that's good. <laughs> Roll call. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Commissioner Terrapani? Yes. Vice Mayor Larson? Yes. Mayor Archie? 
Yes. We'll now go to um, item uh, 22, 23, which is uh, resolution 2014-14, application 14-18. Did I miss one? Yeah, you said 22. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see. Um, item 22C, which is Ordinance 2014-09, Zoning Classification. First read. Ordinance 2014-07, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, annexing approximately 10.99 acres, more or less, of real property lying in the north half of Section 06, Township 27 South. Range 16 East, located at 43520 U.S. Highway 19 North, providing for findings and providing an effective date. It's first reading of Ordinance 2014-07 by title only. We have uh, two of them, I think, are legislative and quasi-judicial. Uh, you want to take them all together and then uh, sure. vote separately? Do you want to read all three ordinances? Yeah, I'll read all okay. three, please. Ordinance 2014-08, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending the future land use map of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida for annexed property lying in the north half of Section 06. Township 27 South Range 16 East, located at 43520 U.S. Highway 19 North. From Pinellas County, future land use designation of ROR, residential office retail, to City of Tarpon Springs, future land use designation of ROR, residential office retail. Providing for findings and providing effective dates, first reading of 2014-0A by title only, second reading held on May 20, 2014, published in Tampa Bay Times on April 6 and May 9, 2014. Ordinance 2014-09, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending the official zoning map of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida for annexed property lying in the north half of Section 06, Township 27 South, Range 16 East, located at 43520 U.S. Highway 19 North, from Pinellas County, zoning designation of CP1, Commercial Parkway District to City of Tarpon Springs, zoning designation of HB, Highway Business District, providing for findings and providing an effective dates, ordinance 2014-09, first reading by title only. Second reading will be held on May 20, 2014, and was published in the Tampa Bay Times by title only with a map on April 6, and published again on May 9, 2014. Mr. Thank you. This is application 14-14 for Furman Chevrolet and Volvo. Uh, this is an annexation application for approximately 11.06 acres. And upon annexation, applying uh, for the proper future land use category as well as the City of Tarpon Springs zoning category. Uh, this is uh, an enclave piece in and of itself. It's completely surrounded by Pinellas County, uh, excuse me, City of Tarpon Springs uh, jurisdiction. So this will be closing that annexation completely, so that's a good thing. Uh, what's prompting the annexation, uh, the, the dealership is proposing to do some um, additions that are triggering our mandatory annexation because they will be requiring additional water and sewer service from the city of Tarpon Springs. So that's what's prompting the annexation. Um, as stated in the uh, ordinances that have already been read, um, the future land use designation on this will stay the same. It will go from Pinellas County Residential Office Retail designation to City of Tarpon Springs, a Residential Office Retail Future Land Use Map Classification, and the zoning will be amended from the Pinellas County designation of CP1 to the City of Tarpon Springs designation of Highway Business. Um, there are no issues with the city's ability to provide service to this property. Uh, most services are already provided by the city. Really, the only thing that will change at this point is upon ex annexation, the city will provide police service to the property. Pinellas County has not uh, indicated that they intend to challenge the annexation. Planning and Zoning Board did review this on April 21st and voted unanimously to approve the annexation, future land use map designation, and the zoning designation. Uh, there was uh, just a general discussion about how this became its own little enclave, and it was uh, some of the Historians uh, noted that this was part of a larger parcel at one point in time and it's just been systematically annexed and this was the last piece that has never been annexed into the city. So with that, staff recommendation is to approve ordinances 2014-07, 2014-08, and 2014-09. Thank you. You want us to deal with this legislative portion? Or? Please. Yeah, we'll go with the first two. Yeah. Um, uh, item number 22 is the annexation 1414 as far as uh, Furman Chevrolet uh, Volvo annexation. Uh, can we get a motion for approval? We have approval. Second. <coughs> uh, roll call. Commissioner Sieber? 
Yes. Commissioner Chair Penny? Yes. Vice Mayor Larson? Yes. Mayor Archie? Yes. Item number 22 is order is 2014-08, um, future land use designation. Um, this is also first read in legislative uh, motion. Move approval. Second. Roll call. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Commissioner Terrapin? Yes. Vice Mayor Larson? Yes. Mayor Archie? Yes. And item 22C is ordinance 2014-09 zoning classification first reading and I don't know whether uh, the applicant uh, Ms. Cole has anything that she'd like to um, with that roll call give me a motion, a motion. No, no, for approval. second okay Commissioner Sieber yes Commissioner Terrapin yes Vice Mayor Larson yes Mayor Archie yes um the next item we have is resolution 2014-14 application 1418 conditional use for series 4 cop um srx for property located in 1981 north manelas avenue in the uh, highway business zoning district Resolution 2014-14, a resolution of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, approving application number 14-18 for a fourth COP SRX license allowing for the on-premise consumption of beer, wine, and liquor for a restaurant located at 1980, 1981 North Pinellas Ave. <coughs> providing for findings and providing for an effective date, that's resolution 2014-14 by title only. At this time, I would ask the Commission to disclose any ex parte communications on this application. Witnesses have been sworn. Thank you. This is application 14-18 for property at 1981 North Pinellas Avenue. This is a an conditional use application for a 4COP special restaurant license that will allow the consumption of beer, wine, and liquor on premise in conjunction with a minimum 150 seat restaurant. Uh, this particular location has had this the same license uh, for two, at two different restaurants in the past, um, going back to ABC Pizza, and at this it, but there's been a lapse of more than one year since alcohol service has been at the property. So the previous approval for the conditional use has lapsed. So that's back in front of you again. Um, under the review criteria, uh, there really are no issues with the standards for review for granting this particular license. As we stated, there's been a license there for at least two different restaurants, if not three, uh, in the past. Planning and Zoning Board did recommend approval of this unanimously at their April 21st, 2014 member. Um, There was a question regarding if there had been any incident reports with the police, um, and we indicated that uh, you know the police do set our TRC meeting, meetings, and they did not express any concerns. The applicant indicated they intended to operate from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. seven days a week. Um, and with that, the uh, staff recommendation is to approve Resolution 2014-14 um, with no additional conditions of approval. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Vincent, not that it affects the review mm -hmm. criteria or the application, but do we, just out of curiosity, do we know what type of restaurant is going to be there? Uh, they publicly stated that this actually is the Holiday Diner that's moving there from, okay. from Holiday, so well-established right. restaurant. Thank you. Did the uh, applicant like to make a comment? Is, is the applicant here? They get noticed that they need to be here it's at, your, at your pleasure, I guess, is whether well, you want to go forward with this. I don't know if we had any questions for the applicant. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> uh, you know, see it done, then if uh, everybody's good with that, Joe will entertain a motion. Move for approval. Second. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Commissioner Terrapani? Yes. Vice Mayor Larson? Yes. Mayor Archie? Yes. Uh, we have item 24A and B application 1420 uh, show uh, rezoning application 115 uh, South Spring Boulevard A is withdrawal of application 1420 and B is uh, consensus on alternative proposal to amend the R60 zoning district list of conditional uses to allow a bed and breakfast establishment. This is also quasi addition. Uh, thank you. Uh, 
as you may already be aware, application 14-20 was a rezoning application from R60 to, R, uh, to CRM district, which would have allowed a follow-on application uh, by the Shoals to establish a bed and breakfast at the location of uh, 115 South Spring Boulevard. Um, the Planning and Zoning Board uh, unanimously recommended denial of that application. Um, I, and the, the, the tone of the conversation was they, they actually like the idea of a bed and breakfast you know, at this location and perhaps some other locations in the area. They didn't like the means to have how we were, how we were getting there. So um, to that end, there seemed to be a consensus that they would like to see some sort of a, an amendment to the code that would allow them to apply under the current zoning uh, perhaps as a conditional use um, and, and bring that back in front of, uh, you know, for, for the full review. So staff is very supportive of drafting uh, such an amendment. Uh, we'd like to be able to do some research of some of what some other cities are doing, places like St. Augustine and um, how they're addressing bed and breakfast. Um, there's kind of this new animal out there that's called Airbnb. You know, I would encourage you to go on their website and look at it. Um, these things are kind of operating, frankly, under the radar right now. Um, but it's a, it's a service out there where you can invite people in to stay in your home if you have a spare bedroom and things like that. So there's some bigger nuances than just operating bed and breakfast that I'd like to be able to perhaps address when we take a look at this and strengthen our ordinance before we put it in there. So I'll be doing that research and hopefully within a month or two bringing something back um, for a discussion with the Board of Commissioners. Um, if you have any suggestions or things that you would like us to research, please let me know either now or if you think of something you know, by way of the city manager or, you know, let's let us know what you would, you know, potentially might like included in this. Um, I don't know if Mr. Scholl wants to say anything about his application. I think he might if he has the opportunity during some public comment, so. Well, uh, we might, let's, uh, I guess we got two things on. And first is withdrawal of application. Uh, do we have to, uh, to vote as far as that, or that's just all? Uh, he's he's officially withdrawn it. Okay. I think he may like to speak uh, to it himself, though. So from from that, uh, uh, you know, my thoughts is we can have Mr. Shola or, or uh, whomever, Gina, anybody else that would like to speak to this item. But uh, I think it's a good idea. I mean, it, to me, it seems like a perfect place for a bed and breakfast. Actually, <coughs> uh, I know that the historical society has asked that they might have an opportunity sure. to to weigh in for as far as it's concerned. But, um, Shoal uh, uh, would like to speak to this item. I don't know if Mr. Santella has anything to say. Good evening. My name is Donald Shoal. I live at 115 South Spring Boulevard, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you tonight. Uh, I'll keep it as brief as I can. It was a bit of a dilemma when we decided to come to the city and get approvals. We, we have all of our state approvals. The state has made three inspections of our home. Uh, my wife had to go to a class, or one day class, to make sure she understood about germs and so on in the, in the kitchen and so forth. Um, I have uh, owned this property for 39 years. I've lived there for 36 years. Uh, I had three children. They had cars. We had two cars, so many times there would be five cars in our driveway. I have two lots, so I do have sufficient, you know, parking. I would only have three cars if we were full, you know, full up. Right now we're operating under Airbnb, and I think what Renee's comments are is that this is a coming thing. We get some guests uh, from Europe, maybe 10, 15 percent of them are from Europe. Um, this property was a rooming home at one time. It had numbers on the doors, and it had a sign for rooms. I took that sign to the, I still have it, to the uh, P&Z meeting. Um, because of the comments of the P&Z, it was obvious that, to me that the majority, I and mean, even the people in the audience, were supportive of uh, bed and breakfast there. I mean, there are a lot of benefits to the city, because we direct people to go to, in our town, to go to the restaurants and so forth. Uh, the property would still be in a historic district. There was, you know, when I was faced with this in the beginning, you know, I didn't want to do rezoning, the fees on it and uh, all the state fees. I'm over $2,000 right now, and there's a little more that's still going to have to be spent. Um, so 
the only way that I was, it was explained to me, actually some of the people that were objecting said, look, just get the commission to amend the code so that our uh, 60 will have a bed and breakfast and under the conditions that you feel reasonable, you know, the adequate parking, number of bedrooms or whatever. Uh, so that's why I withdrew this uh, rezoning application. There really isn't any other avenue for me to go to get this approved. And for those of you who may not be familiar with my particular piece of property, but uh, I'm on the south end of the Spring Bayou, the gingerbread house where, where they throw the cross and so forth. Um, the uh, problem with a large old home is the maintenance. You know, I mean, one of the problems, but all homes have maintenance. I've had this house on the market for almost eight years. I've reduced the price by 60%. One of the comments I get from everybody is, how do you take care of the, you know, the maintenance and so on? And by having a B&B, &B, this will help me to take care of that. And uh, um, I reside in Colorado in the summers. So I'll be leaving in about 10 days to two weeks. I don't know exactly when. Gene Santella is going to be my agent. So this is really the only opportunity I'm going to have to come before you. I'm like the guy, I just need mine done, but it's going to have to be across the board, excuse me, for the whole city, for the ordinance. I don't think there's many people that are in that uh, zoning district that have two lots, so I don't know, I don't anticipate this being overwhelmed with requests to have B&Bs. Um, so that's where we are, and I think that uh, the B&B &B is a really healthy thing for the city. The positive comments by our guests, I mean, all, I, I would say universally about the city and the view of Tarpon Springs, and I've always thought that's one of the prettiest views of Tarpon Springs and Springs Bayou. <clears throat> they go and they, you know, tell their friends about it, and they've said that, and they have done it. and and so. That's where we are now. We're, we're not in operation anymore till we get back and th we get this approved, hopefully. But uh, this is something that I'm going first, but you know this will apply to other properties. So when you do your conditions for the conditional use, make them the way you want them so that you feel that things are going to be protected. So I don't have any other comments unless anybody has any questions I, I, I don't have any for you I, my thoughts is that you know from everything that I've seen you know it, it, the problem was basically trying to rezone and what that would open up for as yes. additional worms uh, and so that as we look at moving forward it won't be just for you but whatever we craft we have to craft it with the understanding that you know, within that area, others can do it. So there's some things that probably need to be done. That's why Ms. Vincent talked about, you know, it taking a month or so and trying to get input from everybody and moving ahead. But like as I said first, I think that it's, it's to me the ideal place to, to do a bread and breakfast in terms of there. So there's just some things that we need to work out for as right, we're thank concerned. You. But uh, with that, Commissioner Tarpin. Thank you. <clears throat> and I would just echo uh, somewhat of the mayor's comments in terms that I think at the PNZ the issue was not necessarily with the bed and breakfast, but with what was uh, permitted within the, the rezoning. Um, so I, I commend you, uh, Mr. Scholl, for dropping back and punting and withdrawing your application and going about it in a little bit different way. And also I'd, I'd like to thank staff for uh, your ability and willingness to help and, and move forward with this uh, amendment to the R zoning. Thank you. Else. I, I just want to make one other comment to something. When we wrote the letter of uh, generally what we were doing, we mentioned that we were gone six months of the year. If I were to, if I were to get this approval, I would want that for 12 months of the year because I don't know if somebody buys my house and they want to run a B and B. They may not. You know, they're going to be here all year round. So. Uh, I just wanted to clarify that point. And, and from my perspective, you know, whether, it's to me, whether you're living in there and doing the, the bed and breakfast, which I've known people, my, my 
my wife likes them a lot more than I do. <laughs> but, um, you know, a lot of people live in the homes and still do that. So I, I don't have a problem. I, you would craft it, you know, whatever things that you'd like to have in terms of changing it. I would ask if you probably get with Ms. Nelson uh, to make sure that she, you know, looks at that so that we can look at it. Because um, I doubt if the ordinance is going to be one that talks in terms of a limited um, time period for doing it. So if that's going to be good for others, it'll be good for you. So yes, um, that's the way we look at it you know, me and moving forward. But um, anybody else have any? Uh, Commissioner Simon? I want to thank you. Yes, we definitely have a need for uh, B&Bs or, or uh, small uh, areas for our, our visitors to, to stay. That's uh, the most common complaint I hear from visitors when they come to Tarpon that yes. uh, they'd like to stay more than a few hours or even a day and this would allow them more time in Tarpon Springs and uh, and and a walkable community to go between uh, the docks and downtown and uh, appreciate what you're doing thank well you. it's encouraging to hear those comments thank you um, I'm not sure if there are any public comments on this item I, I don't think I think you got your consensus okay any uh, public comments? Anita Prost, 901 Bayshore Drive. I believe when the motion was made, and I will listen to the tapes, and if I am wrong, I will come and tell you, but the motion was made because of the historic preservation of the Golden Crescent that we did not want B and B's. Let me give you some history. Um, when the motel was built years ago, the zoning didn't even address it. When the Sun Bay was established years and years and years ago, it wasn't even addressed. Uh, we have those two facilities there now, and what we've got going on in those, the city doesn't even monitor. On the weekends, they throw people out with their clothes and everything, and they're there standing with signs. We need shelter, we need money, we need food. There's drug activity down there in those two areas, and it's bad. But it's not, the, the uh, Sun Bay, I think is what it's called, is not on the Golden Crescent. Yes, the motel is. When it was built, it was owned by businessmen in town, and the mayors then went ahead and approved it. So through the years, it's been sold, and there's a lot of ugly activity there. The Golden Crescent is one of our star historic crowns here in Tarpon Springs. Uh, during that meeting, there were people in the audience, and one letter, his neighbor, and then uh, Mrs. Carr wrote a letter that, you know, they approved of it, but there were some people from the neighborhood that were against it. And when the motion was made, it was not to allow B&Bs on the Golden Crescent. Now, I see in the backup, it said that uh, staff is supporting it. Well, yes, staff is going to support it because they're not interested in the historic preservation there. And once you lose it and it starts, it's going to go on and on, and you're going to lose what you have there. When uh, Commissioner Vinson wanted to put his law practice behind his big house, we led the fight not to put businesses there. We said the only one there was Dr. Clough because years and years ago, when we didn't have these zonings, he put his doctor's office in there. When Wayne Keene wanted to build his house on the corner further down, there was a hell of a fight there not to let him build what he wanted. And the man had to take the city to court, or he had to go to court to get what he, to be able to build his house. Mrs. Galarakis's house, before the Stancils bought it, there were two buyers who wanted that house and came to the city for a bed and breakfast way back past 20 years ago, and the city said no. This is a historic site. When Mr. Galar uh, when Mr. Cavicles came to the city and wanted to put a motel or a condo there, he was told no because it's a historic area. And I can go on with pe and on with stories of people who wanted to put establishments there in the in the uh, fruit section. There were some uh, houses to be sold where artists wanted to go in and put their art galleries in there, and they wanted to live there. No, because of the historic preservation 
of the fruit section and the golden crescent. Now, we have to look at what we've got in our community. And once you start, it's going to grow and grow. And he may have a buyer, I don't know, for the house who wants a B&B. &B. I have no idea. But if you do it just for two or three months, they're going to come say, I want it longer. And then it's going to just escalate on and on. We have a bed and breakfast on Tarpon Avenue. That's a very beautiful place, and they do well. But you have to be conscious of what you've got in Tarpon on the bayou. You have to look at the historic uh, value of it. And it's been in the paper, Mr. Mayor, and you've spoken about it before. I'm going to be very sure about this. And I am not in support, even as a taxpayer, of opening up the Golden Crescent to this type of business. And, and I appreciate your comment. No, and I know what you're going to you say. Could, because no. you've never had respect for anything that I've ever said there. <laughs> and I know all, exactly. All I was going to ask you, if you could just kind of wrap that I up. I am going to wrap know, it up. Had the four if you allow this, then you have turned your back on what the zoning is supposed to stand for to protect what we have there. He wanted to go backwards when I was a commissioner, and we wanted to go forward with what we have there now. You can't have it both ways. I am very disappointed in what's come up here about the Golden Crescent, but you have a responsibility to, to protect the historic preservation of this community. Did you get your letter from the Historical Society? Yes, we have that. Good. As soon as you get through Good, I'm with glad. Your comments. But we are still going to look at this very hard, and I know I am myself as a taxpayer. I'm very disappointed that we're going to have to have this because I'm going to tell you. Once you lose it, it's gone. We've gone through the sponge docks with this. We're going through this now. We've been through it with the fruit section. What's wrong? Something's sick up here because you don't protect our historic value of this community. You know, uh, uh, me, I don't mind getting beat, but I like to get beat during the four minutes you have, not the extra time. That, that's, that's okay. I got the chief here with me. Um, did you have something to say? I, I just want to state for the record, half of the Golden Crescent has CRM zoning and can have a B&B &B as a conditional use right now. So we're not inventing something new or creating the wheel. Mr. Vincent's house, the houses on that side of the bayou are all zoned CRM and right now can apply for a conditional use for a bed and breakfast. So I think we're trying to level the playing field a little bit, put some conditions in place, and I'm sorry we can't continue to be the city of no. I mean, that's, I mean, I... We, we, people need places to stay. We can't get a hotel here. A B and B gives people income to be able to maintain the historic properties, and with the right regulations in place, I think it'll be a good thing for the city. Yeah. It, 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 we might not from the audience, there, Mayor. We did talk about civility earlier, but I, I just say this is that you know, um, I know that I understand the responsibility of planning and zoning, and the advisory committee. Whether they had said they didn't, never wanted it there doesn't make a difference as so as far as what we do here. And I'll just say this is that one thing I like to do is that we have a letter from the Historical Society speaking in terms of, of uh, wanting the initial application to be withdrawn and was appreciative of that. And the president of the Historical Society says, we also understand that the city staff has requested that the Board of Commissioners provide direction on whether to pursue a code amendment to allow bed and breakfast facilities as a conditional use in certain zoning districts. Since the most likely, the most likely location for bed and breakfast would be in the historic district, we respectfully request that the Historical Society be consulted on the, on the proposed ordinance and have the opportunity to participate in development of this audit, which I share with Ms. Vincent. So, you know, that being said is that I still think that we have consensus to, to move ahead. And everywhere that I've gone that have historical um, residents, you know, that have bed and breakfast, you can't really tell whether it's a resi uh, uh, residents there that are occupying it or people from um, other parts of the state or country. So I don't see the significance of what the 
Mayor uh, just said, I do respect her right to say it, uh, but I think that uh, we're talking about moving through a process that everybody will have an opportunity to weigh in, including the historical society. Um, so with that, uh, Ms. Vincent, you have uh, what you need to move on. We'll also now move to the next agenda item, which is item 25, resolution 2014-10, establishment, establishing a perennial foot fee for sidewalk trust fund in lieu of sidewalk construction areas where sidewalks are not practical. Resolution 2014-10, a resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, establishing a per-linear foot fee for payment into the Sidewalk Trust Fund pursuant to sections 132.01, 132.02, and 132.03 of the City of Tarpon Springs Comprehensive Zoning and Land Development Code when the construction of a sidewalk is determined to be not practical, providing for severability and providing for an effective date. It's resolution 2014-10 by title only. Thank you. This is resolution 2014-10, establishing a per linear foot fee for payment into the sidewalk trust fund <laughs> pursuant to sections 131.01, 132.02, 132 and 132.03 of the City of Tarpon Springs Conference of Zoning and Land Development Code. Uh, in September 2013, the Board of Commissioners adopted Ordinance 2013-19, amending the, co uh, the Land Development Code to establish a sidewalk trust fund to allow for payment in lieu of construction of sidewalks under certain conditions. In accordance with that ordinance, um, a fee must be established on a per linear foot street of frontage basis uh, to be calculated as 1.2 time, 1.25 times the average of sidewalk construction cost. Uh, resolution 2014-10 does establish that. We are using the latest uh, FDOT statewide item average unit cost for four inch sidewalk construction, uh, which is 1244 per linear foot of a four inch sidewalk. And um, so, Using the, cal the calculations provided, uh, we come up with the, the uh, fee for the payment in lieu of a fifteen fifty five per lineal foot. Uh, and this will be amended or updated biennially. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Oh, uh, you know, the, looking at, I guess that's um, ordinance 2013-19 mm -hmm. that we're making adjustments to. Um, section one. I'm sorry. That that's. I'm sorry, Mayor. I was. Gonna, I think this is the, the adopted ordinance. Mm -hmm. It was just provided just right through an underlying format because it hasn't been codified yet into into Muni code. So this has been adopted already. The, this is the the resolution is establishing the the side the the trust fund, the, the per lineal foot fee for the sidewalk construction. So. It, all of that underlying will that's be already added, been done. Would be that would be added to it? No, that's already oh, been that's, that's already, already been there. adopted. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm sorry if that was confusing. I should have gotten a you know a, a non-strike through ordinance, but they like said this was just adopted, so it hasn't been adopted in the Muni Code, so I don't have it in its Muni Code format. So this was the, the ordinance 2013-19 was was approved in back in September, and so that strike through and underline you see is all what was what oh, was previously okay. approved. So this is the follow-on resolution as required by that ordinance to adopt the perennial foot fee for payment in lieu of construction of a sidewalk. Well, um, when we make the adjustments, it will be to this uh, ordinance here, and then you're bringing it back as far as no, there's no, put there's, in place in there, we'll do another one? No, there's no adjust. This is the ordinance is just being provided for reference as to okay. why we're adopting resolution 2014-10. That's just establishing, the, really the only thing you're acting on tonight is 2014-10, the, the resolution to establish the perennial foot fee for construction of sidewalks. And, and you say that you've, uh, how did you derive the $15? 50, yeah, if you look at the last page of the resolution, um, the, we're using the state of Florida, or the FDOT, established average per lineal foot cost for construction and then our res our ordinance required it to be 1.25 times that we wanted an additional we wanted to provide an incentive to construct a sidewalk rather than just pay in lieu of so when we adopted our ordinance we established it as 1.25 that times that cost so when you do the math you come out to fifteen dollars and fifty five cents per lineal foot of sidewalk okay Oh, I see the example on the 50-foot lot there. I apologize if this would no, not okay. have been clearly written. I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, 
Penny. Oh, Commissioner Tarpenny. Thank you. Um, I understand the intent of the ordinance, um, but my my only objection is if this is an ordinance that's in place for an area of sidewalk that's not practical, then why are we penalizing for for 125 percent of the actual construction cost? I mean, don't get me right. wrong. I understand if somebody says, "Look, I can build a sidewalk here. I don't want to build a sidewalk here." I understand 125 percent of right. that. But if it's an area where you can't build a sidewalk, then why, why are we penalizing with the additional 25%? In that instance, if you, if you can actually go to the Board of Adjustments and get relief to even have to, to do anything. So there's, there's a mechanism. The, the payment in lieu of is for where it, it may not be practical at this time mm -hmm. versus you can't physically do it because there's, if, you can st if you can demonstrate to the Board of Adjustments that you absolutely cannot put a sidewalk in for lack of right of way and things like that, mm -hmm. then you will get relief from the entire order. You want it to pay and you won't have to build the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of an intermediate step where if we know that we have sidewalks that are going to be coming through as part of a sidewalk program, maybe in a year or something like that, or uh, other, you know, other circumstances, then we can allow them to just go, if they're willing, to just go ahead and pay in. And But the incentive, the, the 1.25 um, was really we prefer people to build the sidewalk, but sure. if there is some compelling reason that to allow them to not build it versus paying in, or to paying in versus not building it, then this was the mechanism that was put in place. So, so there's there's language, not to interrupt you, but there's language yeah. in the ordinance that speaks to what you just said in yes. terms of going to the board of adjustment. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Oh, uh, Bryce Smith. Thank you. I know the the question I'm asking isn't related to what's coming before us now because we're not supposed to be looking at the ordinance we're only looking That's at okay. the resolution I, I understand that but i think something <clears throat> excuse me something that commissioner terrapani brought up just kind of got my brain thinking about this um as it stands right now someone could say if i understand correctly they could say that look i can't build a sidewalk here so i don't want to pay the the 1.25 you know mathematical calculation so they could then go to the Board of Adjustments and pay nothing. Is that, I, if, if, there's a, if there's a reason that they cannot because, let's say there's not enough right of way or there's some really weird physical circumstance there whereby you would, the same process that you would normally go to the Board of Adjustments to get a waiver to build a sidewalk, you know, this is kind of an intermediate step where, and if you look at the ordinance itself, um, it, under 132.02, that's where the, the sidewalk trust fund in lieu of construction is established. And then sections B, you know, B1 and C give you the, the criteria for where you can pay in versus having to build the sidewalk. So where there's no existing sidewalk to which the proposed sidewalk can, can connect and it's unlikely that there will be additional development nearby which will require the construction of additional sidewalks if the parcel terminates. So there's some conditions listed here whereby staff can make a determination that it's acceptable to go ahead and pay into the sidewalk trust fund in lieu of building the sidewalk. We can still say, no, you have to build the sidewalk. We think there's merit. And in order for them to not build the sidewalk, if we don't agree to let them pay in, they would have to go to the Board of Adjustments and prove that it can't be built for some reason, like there's not enough right of way. So it's, again, it was, and this was really actually being driven by the Board of Adjustments who really wanted this interim pay in lieu of versus having to just say, give them a variance in, in, you know, in all circumstances and get nothing. So it, if we need to revisit this ordinance, we will. Well, this and, point, and I, don't, I, you know. I know this wasn't what was intended <laughs> know, for us to discuss right now. And we're kind of rehashing things that we did talk about previously. Yeah. But I, I guess what I'm wondering now is it, it, it seems to me like nobody's ever going to pay the 1.25. That they're, oh, they're I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, if somebody does pay it, believe it or not. I mean, some people just philosophically don't want to build that sidewalk. So, But they would only get to that point if it is determined that the installation of a sidewalk is not practical. And if they can prove that it's not practical, they'll probably just go to the Board of Adjustments and say, I don't want to pay it's anything. Practical is one thing. Actually, feasible is, is a more stringent standard. You know, and, it, and like I said, the 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 condition that we normally see where you, there simply isn't any right of way available. Yeah, I, I hear what you're that, saying. Yeah. I understand the difference between right. but feasible a good, and practical. You know, if you've got a section of road, like a good example is um, West Martin Luther King. There's, you had a whole section there with no sidewalk on it. And we've actually processed a variance, then it got approved 
um, against our, you know, we recommended denial of it, but it got approved anyway because at that time, point in time, the Board of Adjustments was like, well, this is just silly. There's no sidewalks anywhere. All the homes were built in this last lot. You're making them put in a sidewalk. Yeah. Well, in that instance, they could have oper they could have opted to just pay in lieu of, mm -hmm. and and move on. Um, I guess what I'm wondering, and, and maybe I don't I don't know, maybe tonight's not the night to have this conversation. Maybe we should agenda this and look at it further but I guess I'm, what I'm wondering is if we should completely take out the 1.25 thing leave it at 1.0 uh, whatever that calculation is each year um, but also remove the concept of going to the Board of Adjustments and we, waving it all together we, we talked about that I know we did we I apologize this. for bringing it I, up I guess again what, but I, I don't want to be argumentative. I guess what I would like to do is let's let the ordinance go for a little while and see how it's working and functioning. And if it's, you know, if it's not, then we'll bring it back and revisit it. So far, we haven't had anybody be able to even, it hasn't come up yet. These, these sidewalk situations come up maybe once or twice a year, really. Yeah. So sure. it's not going to be a frequently used ordinance, I feel. And, and I want to say I do appreciate the work that staff put into this. I appreciate the fact that uh, the calculation does include labor costs. I think that's important. Uh, I, I do appreciate the uh, effort on, on this. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I, I guess, you know, I don't know if, if we're going to look at, you know, at some point in time as far as what Vice Mayor said. I guess when, when you put this other one in here, not only did it, <laughs> Um, I apologize. <laughs> it just it, it it brings you know some questions, and the first one I basically had was it said that the board of adjustments and I guess that was put in there because of some things that happened shall not consider the non-presence of other sidewalks as justification to grant the waiver. You know, so you know that's kind of in there. Uh, now I was I actually questioned why it was in there, but I see. <laughs> that it, it's it been might ignored. be important to um, not have as many people just saying, well, there are no sidewalks here, you know, so therefore I just go and get a board, uh, uh, get the Board of Adjustment to approve it so that, you know, it uh, just validates not having it. And I, I know kind of what we wanted to accomplish, um, and I, I don't mind seeing if it if it does accomplish it, but what I would ask is that we would kind of monitor, you Absolutely. know, what's happening as far as the audience is concerned, sure. and what's happening with Board of Adjustments. Are they uh, getting those, and how are those things going, so we can weigh out. Absolutely. Trying to put in place what we would desire for is still trying to encourage people to put sidewalks in, you know. Commissioner, did you have something? No, no I agree. Uh, any uh, public comments on this? Then Chair will entertain a motion. It's been a slow night for motion. <laughs> I guess motion to approve resolution 2014-10. Is there a second? Second. Roll call. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Commissioner Terrapani? Yes. Vice Mayor Larson? Yes. Mayor Archie? Yes. Um, item 26, ordinance of 2014-10, floodplain management regulation, first reading. <clears throat> ordinance 2014-10, an ordinance of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida. Amending Chapter 6 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Tarpon Springs by amending Article 6, Floodplain Management, by amending Article 1, Section 6-1 of the Local Administrative Amendments to the 2010 Florida Building Code, providing for applicability, repealer, severability, and an effective date. It's first reading of Ordinance 2014-10 by title only. Second reading will be held on May 20, 2014, and the ordinance will be published in the Tampa Bay Times by title only on May 9, 2014. Mr. Basquale. Uh, yes, good evening. Um, uh, 2000, uh, Ordinance 2014-10 is basically a, the result of our previous ordinance that we adopted, which I've provided you in its entirety in the backup as an attachment. It's to Ordinance 2012-12. After that ordinance was adopted, it was transmitted through the state and up through FEMA. After some period of time, and you know everything at the federal level takes a little longer than we like, 
FEMA did come back through the Department of Emergency Management and made the recommended changes that you see, and I've highlighted those and, and underlined them and, and provided color bolding. Um, most of them are very editorial in nature. Um, nevertheless, FEMA felt they were important in our ordinance and is asking that we make these changes. Um, I've provided them uh, per section throughout the ordinance for you, and I'll be glad to answer any questions uh, that you may have. Any question for Mr. Pasqua? Um, any public comments on this item? Chair will entertain a motion. Move for approval. Second. Roll call. Mr. Sieber? Yes. Mr. Terrapin? Yes. Vice Mayor Larson? Yes. Mayor Archie? Yes. Uh, item 27, Resolution 2014-50, Public Works Department Reorganization. Resolution 2014-15, a resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, authorizing changes in the Public Works Organization, including elimination of paraprofessional geographical information services and adding a newly created position in Water Distribution Division and providing for an effective date hereof. It's resolution 2014-15 by title only. So I'll have Tom Function talk about this uh, new position we're proposing. Yeah, uh, over the last few years, uh, we've... Uh, started using uh, geographical information systems, which is a location of uh, uh, different utilities, water, sewer, signage. Uh, and we had hired a, profession, a power professional company uh, in order to uh, give us this service. Uh, as the, uh, we've gone into this over here, of course, the demand for this type of service increased. But unfortunately, the gentleman that was working for this power professional company uh, is no longer able to work anymore for health reasons. Uh, to find someone with this type of experience is, is kind of hard to find, and it's fairly, uh, costly. Uh, we got lucky the first time we found uh, need the service, realized we need it, uh, but it's come to our attention that it's possible that we may have people in, inside the city here uh, that would meet these requirements. Uh, so we're using the monies that we already have earmarked inside the budgets, stormwater, water, distrib uh, water distribution, and uh, sewer collections in order to uh, cover the cost to hire someone in-house to uh, continue these services. Uh, at the bottom over here, of course, we have some, uh, this year will be funded uh, a small percentage because the, end of the time we are into the year, halfway through the uh, fiscal year, and of course next year we just we uh, have the funds again to uh, continue this position for a long time. Let me add that uh, obviously the importance of knowing what's underground as we as many things happen and occur is, is vital. Um, one of the reasons for creating this position is we've got. <coughs> We've got many, many, many years to go throughout this city and, and to do this function. So um, that is why it's the perfect opportunity. It's not something that will get done in a year or two years. It's going to take a long amount of time. And an employee doing this is going to save probably his salary's worth uh, by the locates. And uh, because every time we seem to dig somewhere, there's something on underground that's not on any plans or, or anything. Plus, the other thing about this is it gives some people inside of the city, including people that may be affected by the building department or organization, uh, a chance to go for this job. So we believe we've got the capabilities in-house from there. And uh, uh, with the monies from the different storm waters and stuff, um, it's needed. And uh, we've got employees here that know the city. So I think it's the perfect job and stuff to utilize that for that case. And, uh, that's what I look to do if this job's improved. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Function, I'll tell you sure. today, as a, as a side note, a quick story. I'm putting in a real estate sign in the ground, right? <laughs> Boom, water line. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a locate? I had, no, I had a call from Ellis <laughs> County. They had to come and fix it. It was, it was in front of the meter, so yes. I couldn't even turn the water off. So <laughs> like, I, This I is how important this, this is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so my first question to you was, uh, but you, you addressed it, was the difference between the $30,000, $33,000 for this year and $60,000 $60, for next year. Right, 33000 We're going to hire this person immediately. Yes. And it's half of the salary. That's correct. So my second question is, it's uh, that we have a qualified person within the city. Yes. Who is it? Uh, it's engineering. It's uh, Doug Gemmel. We, uh, uh, when the gentleman that was working for the yeah. excuse me, yeah, that's one we do have to we do, I believe have to put it out for five. We at least get one. We probably we probably got two inside that's mm -hmm. fully capable and yes, 
when we advertise in Dando internally, I fully plan to take advantage of those people who've been here a long time and know the place because that's the perfect person. Not that you know we were lucky to get an individual that wasn't that case, but who was great with it. Unfortunately, he doesn't continue. This gives us the offer time to do somebody from here, from the city, that knows the town and stuff, and that especially people within that that uh, department that knows the value of, of where things are. So I fully expect it to employ that within the next five to ten days with someone from in the city. So so we expect to have this position advertised within the next five to ten days or hired within the next five days? All I have to do is I, I believe advertise in-house for five days and then I can interview the in-house applicants and make the decision. Thank you. Any uh, additional questions? Any public comments to this item? Chair will entertain a motion. Move for approval. Second. Is that a second? Commissioner Sieber, second. Oh, I okay. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> roll call. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Commissioner Terrapani? Yes. Vice Mayor Larson? Yes. Mayor Chief? Yes. I believe this concludes our agenda. Uh, Chief? Yes, Mayor. I'd like to um, I'd like to talk real quick about our successes with uh, the Greek Orthodox Easter event over the last two years, as well as some concerns that have been raised this year. Um, we've really partnered strongly with the church over the last two years to denounce and go after the culture of detonating bombs during this event. And the church deserves a lot of credit here because for the last two years we've had no bombs to law during this event. And, and from a public safety perspective, that's a big win. Um, this year, we had some concerns that were brought forward about police presence, and myself, the mayor, city manager, um, our operations captain, Barbara Templeton, met with some church officials. It was a very productive meeting. We agreed to move forward in partnership to address some of those issues as we get closer to um, the Greek Orthodox events next year. But um, we can work with them. Um, we can probably make some adjustments, so I will not publicly talk about our safety plans, but um, I just wanted to, because this is out there about, you know, police presence, that we are working with the church, the partnership's strong, and we'll move forward next year to try and remedy some of the concerns. That's my comments. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you. Nothing, sir. Is it manager? Yes, a few things. Um, first, we'll start with a positive, the positive note, and then we'll get to the neutral one, because civilian ones, they'll be neutral and not negative. So we'll start with the positive one. Um, as most of you know, we, we uh, worked with the website and the posting of the agenda and were able, despite some computer glitches uh, that hit us, um, to get all the agendas items we could up Tuesday a full week before the meeting. Um, we are going to continue to try to work on that um, based on the comments. Um, it's not two weeks, but it's a week. Um, two things, it'll give citizens more time, it'll give you more time, but um, I just want to caution, as we're working this through and stuff, I want to caution you on some things. First of all, what, what you see if we post it Monday or Tuesday might not be when it gets to Friday and the agenda there. Some things may be pulled for reasons, um, some things may be changed, you might have rough drafts on there. Um, you might just have, if it's something that went through the planning zoning, you might have their backup. We're going to try to post all the information we can, but realize that, again, some of it will be in draft form, some of it won't be finalized. Again, some of it might not even appear in the agenda. You'll see it Friday. Oh, it's not there. For whatever reason, it had to be moved. But, again, it'll give you more time uh, to see things as they come. Now, I can't promise that for all items, but everything we can. Um, when we have those times where there's three weeks and before, we'll try to make it a little sooner. Um, so maybe two weeks ahead, there might only be two items up there, but if there's items and we have the backup for them, we're going to at least try to get them posted a, a week ahead of time, especially on those weeks where we got two and, and maybe a little sooner. But again, there'll be a lot, of, there could be some drastic changes from Tuesday to Friday, because sometimes even up to the meeting, we're working on some changes of agenda. That's why you get changes, backups up here and stuff. So um, everybody just realize that and we're going to, we're going to work on that and um, hopefully that gives more time for people to review the information, for people to call and talk to us, whether it's the commission about agenda items with plenty of time to not do crash courses over the weekend, and for citizens to encourage to call in and talk to us, which probably leads me to the second and third thing I want to talk about. Um, 
First of all, going back to the Bayou Restoration Project and uh, some things I've heard of concerns, I want to encourage everybody, if you have somebody or members of the public who has concerns about the Bayou Restorations Project, please have them call me, come see me so I can talk with them because to this date, I've only got Ms. Protus and one other person who is concerned about walking that has ever talked to me about concerns with the, with the citizens with Bayou Restoration Projects. I've heard a lot out there from different, there's all this, people upset and this and that. I would like them to come talk to me and uh, so I can get that input from them. So please direct them to come talk to me so we can talk about input. Um, that's the thing that works. That's where people can get the information because there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's people who misinterpret things like we heard tonight of saying some things I said that I didn't say. Um, so it's better if they get it right from me and, and come talk to me and, and please don't give me, you know, the thing that, well, they don't want to come talk to you. They can bring somebody, they can bring one of you, they can bring somebody to do. I'm approachable to anybody and, you know, some of these things about I'm not approachable. Um, you know, although I find ridiculous, I'll, I'll be at that, but they can bring anybody they want, bring more people. The more people that come talk about these things and get them input from me, to me, the better, because they don't come to me and give me input that I don't have those, and we can look at some things. And remember, I had said before, when this thing gets closed out with the federal government, which I emphasize, we're dealing with the federal government, we need to get this thing closed out. I have said way back from the start, we can look at the things. I hope it comes down to, again, this $4 million project that, you know, we probably shouldn't have got without our hard work. We would have never got it. If the only concerns are two areas where there are a lot of rocks because this was a shoreline restoration project and the Army Corps of Engineers picked the best way to save the shoreline. It wasn't a beautification project. It was that. But when it's all closed out, done, they're out of there, we find out how much money we get back. And that's what I was concerned about, not about the credits. I was, you know, with all this money we've put in after they add it all up and do it, hopefully we'll get some of that money back to us. That's what I was hoping to get money back for. Hopefully that money we've committed, once they add up all the tallies and, and stuff, we'll get it back. But they work very slowly. But once they're out of here, we can talk about a lot of different options. We can talk about boardwalks and scenic things over the, the rock portion. We can talk about landscape. We talk about a whole bunch of things as long as it don't affect the, uh, the shoreline and its restoration. There's a lot of things we can do when that's closed out and we can talk about it and we can open it up to the public. We can talk to the residents there and, and once they're out of here in agreement, then we can do a lot of things and stuff and that's what we're looking for. Again, you know, the government is going to be slow processing and giving us our final thing on this thing. So when we do that, again, there's a lot of things we can talk about doing after they're out of here. I've committed to do that to the people. And please, anybody else who's got concerns or that, please come talk to me so we can prepare to that and do that. And that leads us to the third and final thing, which I'm not going to talk too long about. And trust me, I'm not going to address the newest letter that came in yesterday. Um, but it's the Sponge Docs project and what's going to happen May 20th. Um, I don't plan to begin with on the 20th to make the sponge docks project a presentation we're going to make contentious. All we want the opportunity to do is, you heard Mr. Hoffman say in the audience many times, you know, him and the engineers, and him and the engineers are the ones the city commission, this city hired to do the project. <clears throat> They just want to address all the things you've seen in writing. They want to give you the other side of the story. They want to give you the facts. You know, when I'm, I'm not, and I hope, and we're going to meet with them, and hopefully they're not wishing to debate who's right or wrong. You've just got a lot of documentation that's been, the papers have been called to look at that side of the documentation. People all around are just on face value believing that. I just, you know, want to present the other side of those issues to let everybody see and everybody can make the decisions you want. Unfortunately, we've had a turn, and uh, again, I was warned about this several weeks before it came. Um, I mean, there's a term, and there's some people want to hang members of staff and me because of the project, and you know, that's fine too. We'll answer any of those questions, or we'll talk about them. But again, I don't plan to get contentious. I don't plan to do that unless our integrity, our professionalism is attacked again. And I can tell you, you know, we've taken it in writing. We've been very restrained so far, but um, 
We're about at the point, and obviously this commission can't do nothing about the staff, but they can do something about me, and uh, that's where you'll bring it to because, you know, I, I just can't sit here and let staff and myself be attacked and sit back and not do anything or say nothing. But if we present our side, give it to you to review, we're going to give you how the money was spent, we're going to lay out some things we don't agree with with the written form that's been said either about, you know, the part of it doesn't meet the comprehensive plan or the amphitheater, you know, all this stuff. We're just going to present it. Here it is. We want a documentation way in it because all we want to do from the start back in April is just, okay, we've gone through a long process. We're not able to make it work without people happy. Let's get together, go to the simplified project and go. And we've been welcome to do that. But people put in last minute letters of criticizing and attacking the professionalism. It continues to go on now. Um, we still want to move forward with a new project and, and move on. And hopefully we're just going to present the side for documentation for the case, not argue, just here it is, review it and move on. If we are attacked again and there's any more of this, this stuff that's been going on so far, then we'll respond. But we hope it's not contentious. We hope to just lay that out to you and then move forward and uh, get the plan done and try to get a very nice project done um, for the new season. Hopefully we're going to have a meeting, it looks like Monday, 5.30 at the Heritage Center, um, strictly talking about the lights. Um, Tina Bucavallis and Kathy Monahan have been down trying to poll everybody they can. Again, as I told you before, the lights will be the most time sensitive because there's order in putting them in. So. We're going to be dealing with landscaping, other things first, but we really want to get some consensus of, of the lighting project and to bring it to you um, to see if the community is together with it, you're together with it, because that's the thing we have to move on faster. So hopefully 530 at the Heritage Center, we're going to be putting out press releases, we're going to be putting out flyers. Um, like I said, they've met with a lot of people. This will be an opportunity for everybody else to come together, see if we're consistent on the lights. Again, the lights are not only important for new lights. Um, There'll be our lights, and we won't pay the 300 and some thousand a year to lease the ones we've got from, from Duke Energy. Um, they'll have the capability of electric on top, so we can put Christmas decorations and that sort of thing. They'll be about five or six feet, feet higher, so we can put big banners, epiphany banners, Greek Independence Day, whatever events we have. So, again, it's not just the lights and the advantage of energy efficient um, lights there and new ones that, from lights that have been 15 years, but the ability, again, banners, Christmas lights, um, and just think of the enhancement of docks looking at that with those things on and stuff. So that's the first thing we back, bring back to you is going around that I'm going to come back to 20th and asking you to reinstate the old project. Um, that's not true. Um, I want to move forward with the project that we did. So, you know, I've got several calls on that. Um, Besides some other things, um, if anybody has any questions of what I'm bringing forward to 20th or what's going on, again, please call me and come talk to me and get the word from me. And uh, again, hopefully we can move on and uh, do a good project. That's it. Thank you, sir. Uh, Madam Clerk? Vice Mayor? No comments. Who is Simon? No comments. Um, Mr. Tarpani? Uh, I would just uh, remind everybody that we have a food truck rally on uh, the 10th this coming Saturday and uh, come out and attend. Uh, I, I just say first I want to thank the chief city manager uh, and members of the Greek church for sitting down and, and talking. And one of the things that the city manager talked about that I definitely believe that even though people come and they sometimes they say not so nice things. Uh, about me at the podium, um, you know, I'm always willing to sit down. You know, I, I believe that, hey, we, we get behind closed doors, we say whatever we feel like we need to say, still being respectful, then hopefully we can do some things that we move on and, and do what's best for the city of Tarpon Springs. Uh, my hope is that on May 20th that um, my thoughts is that there are always two sides to every story, that we just be respectful of each other, as we move forward. There can be a lot of allegations as to why this, why that, you know, should have known the rest of that, but I can guarantee you this is that everybody that say you should have known is that they waited on close to two and a half years or more before they even started to talk about certain things. So if it was so obvious, 
about all of this stuff that's supposed to be the truth, then why didn't it come up earlier in all of the conversations? So I, those type of things, hopefully, you know, we can deal with and then do what's best uh, for the city of, of Tarpon, you know. Uh, I'm glad that we do this thing as far as lights. I, I just say this is that, you know, I, I have uh, a, a young man that he's like the guardian of Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Drive, so he always is asking me, you know, what's happening with the lights? And I have some inquiries as to when we're going to replace those lights and, you know, those orange cones and the rest of it. So as we move forward, even with that SpongeDoc project, and we're looking at the contingency of, of what needs to happen when something goes wrong with the lights that we'll have there and we can move forward and, and everybody can be happy. Well, most people will be happy with the end result because in life you're never going to make everybody happen. So uh, my thoughts is that, you know, those that know me know that I don't like, I don't like meetings that we're wasting time. You know, on May 20th, we come in, we do what we need to do. People say what they want to say. And like I say, as long as it's respectful, the rest of that, we get that out of the way. Form your opinion, because I know right now, some people's opinion is not going to be changed. I don't care what said. They're going to go away, say things that are not really the truth about what happened at the meeting, even though it's taped. But that's, that's their, their prerogative. This is what America is about. Everybody can form their own opinion and basically say what they want to say. Sometimes there are some consequences to what we might say. And as public officials, we have to understand that. But other than that, you have four minutes, talk, move on to the next one. So with that, I'm hoping that, you know, with the SpongeDoc project, that we come up with a good project and that the people there are satisfied. You know, uh, city manager know that right now we're still trying to talk about things that will hopefully bring other um, people from outside of this country, you know, here to Tarpon so that everybody can benefit. You know, and the sponge dock is the key to a lot of things that we want to do from a marketing perspective. Anybody that don't understand that, to me, um, have uh, some things loose in their head. You know, it's a destination point. To me, is that the county itself should be spending more money to try to promote Tarpon Springs because Truthfully, we're the only destination that I can see as far as from a cultural perspective of what we have at the docks to anywhere in this county. Yeah, there are parks and there are museums and there are other things that we are blessed to have in this county, but there's nothing like what we have at the sponge dock. So I say to anybody that think that, you know, every time it seems like somebody comes to that podium, they talk about, you know, the legacy that I will leave. Well, you know, uh, I just want to say to those that would like to know the truth is that it is not my wish to destroy Tarpon. You know, I, I, don't, I don't want anybody looking at me later on and say, yeah, that was the guy that was there when they destroyed Tarpon. Him and that city manager, whatever his name is, they destroyed it. That, that's, that's definitely not the truth. So. With that, I look at the journey this meeting at, um, let's say, 844.